good morning and welcome to Rise with Genesis Church. I heard years ago that the word Christian is a lousy adjective, but an excellent verb. In other words, it's not a label we put on ourselves. Being a Christian means to be a follower of Jesus. So I want to invite you into our series as we follow Jesus through the gospel of Matthew and learn what it means to be his followers. Let's worship together this morning. I see your face in every sunrise The colors of the morning are inside your eyes The world awakened in the light of the day I look up to the sky and say You're beautiful, oh I see your power in the moonlit night Where planets are in motion and galaxies are bright We are amazed in the light of the stars It's all proclaiming who you are You're beautiful, oh Recently, my wife and I were in Kansas City spending some time together, and we went into a shop, and it became clear to me that we were on the Missouri side of the city. That's because the shop was filled with all kinds of Wizard of Oz memorabilia, with the tagline, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Most of us have probably seen The Wizard of Oz. We know the storyline. Dorothy and her dog Toto get picked up by a tornado and get flung into the fantasy world of Oz where they become the target of an angry witch because it killed her sister. Desperate to get home, she is told that the journey along the yellow brick road would lead to the emerald city where they would meet the Wizard of Oz who could help her. And along the way, she encounters a group of people who have something missing a brain, a heart, and, and all these characters become part of the community and they travel with her to get all that they need. When they finally reach the wizard, they are greeted to a talking head behind a screen that demands that they go on a journey and get him the witch's broomstick. And eventually they return with the broomstick. And then in the midst of the conversation, Toto the dog pulls down the curtain and it exposes just an ordinary man 
who himself had been accidentally thrown into the magical city, but was now using theatrical effects to try to pretend to be something he isn't. Eventually, we discover that each person in the story already has everything that they need to get what they want. And it's a truly American story about self-actualization, and that explains why it endures to the day. Like Dorothy and her companions, the disciples in our story are on a journey. And our text today has a similar turning point where, where the curtain is removed to reveal something incredible. Unlike the Wizard of Oz, though, what they discover is impressive and awesome, more awesome than they could ever imagine. By following Jesus with them today, we learn some important things about our relationship with God. And the first thing that we learn in our story today is that Jesus invites us to climb mountains. Listen to what it says in verse 1 of chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. What we see here is that the disciples were invited to climb. It's a high mountain, and to climb something would require a whole lot of intentionality and effort on their part. It's not a little hill. It's a high mountain, and Matthew wants us to know that. Have you ever climbed a mountain? Revisit the feelings of mountain climbing if you can. The strain on the legs, the, the wind, the, the need to hold your grip while trying to make progress. This is not a little journey. It's probably hours. And when you get to the top of the mountain, what do you see? You see a panoramic view. You see things more clearly. This is why in many ways mountain tops provide us clarity for our life. And there's a feeling and a sense of awe and divine connection when we get to the mountain. And these guys are by themselves. There's only four guys on this journey, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. And three of them did not know the full purpose for it. It was to strengthen their companionship and understanding with Jesus. Like them, Jesus wants to invite us to climb mountains, to get to a higher plane, if you will, to elevate our view, to gain a heavenly perspective, to get to the truth of Jesus. Last week, we talked about the need for recentering because of a misfocus in the disciples. And so Jesus sent them on a journey in the lake and then came to them walking on the water. Here we see another aspect of recentering, but this is not a storm where they needed to trust God. It was a mountain that they needed to climb. Too often we tend to want to coast in life. We like to go downhill. That's where the fun is. Uh, but there is in essence a need to climb in order to get to those places where we can coast and go downhill. Lent, the Lenten season which we are in now, is really an invitation to climb a mountain, to put some intentionality to work, to make some sacrifices, and to stretch ourselves so that we can more fully connect with God. Morning devotions are like a climb. You spend time with Jesus in the morning. You spend the effort to get to the mountaintop where you can meet with Jesus and see Jesus as he really is. And so Jesus invites us to climb mountains. He doesn't tell us to coast through life. He invites us to climb mountains where we can see clearly. Which then leads us to a second thing that we learn is that Jesus wants to reveal his glory. Listen to what it says in verse 2 of our text. It says, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as as the light. The word is transfigured. It's a Greek word. It's metamorpho from where we get the word metamorphosis. And uh, our biology lessons when we were young taught us about the beauty of metamorphosis, the idea of change where caterpillars turn to butterflies and tadpoles turn to frogs. Notice with me what changed in Jesus, his face and his clothes. What the disciples witnessed was not something coming upon Jesus, but something coming from Jesus, emanating from within. A glow that shined through his skin and shined through his clothing. It's really important for us because Jesus wasn't being changed. He didn't need to be changed in of his essence, but rather is revealing the truth of who he is. That he is in essence robed in flesh 
And the transfiguration reveals the beauty and the truth of his reality. This is an inflection point in Matthew's gospel. Listen again to the beginning of our text where it says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a mountain by themselves. Six days is important because Matthew is tying the previous uh, part of the story to this part. And in the previous part, several things happened with Peter. It says in verse 15 and 16, Jesus is having conversation. And Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter had a revelation about Jesus being the Messiah. He uh, had a burst of inspiration and made a profession of his faith. He was a believer in Jesus it's an affirmation. But then in verse 21 through 23, it says that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turned and said to Peter, get Behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Here we see that right after Peter had this burst of inspiration that came from the work of God in his heart to show him who Jesus was, he was now a tool of Satan because he did not believe in the necessity of a cross. And Jesus had to rebuke him. Get behind me, Satan. Imagine with me how God and the devil might be working simultaneously in a person's life. But that's what we see in Peter. One moment he hears the voice of God speak to him about Jesus, and the next moment he begins to be a mouthpiece for the devil. A believer with baggage, when you think about it. And friends, that's the truth of who we all are. We are all believers with baggage. We get a burst of inspiration about who Jesus is, but then the baggage of our biases and the distorted and incomplete views of God that we have begin to manifest in how we live life. And unless those are corrected by God, um, we will continue to live in darkness and deception, even though we say we believe. Mark Twain once famously said, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. In other words, God needs to move us from being believers to knowers when you think about it. That, that God is at work to reveal the truth of Jesus to us even after we have professed our faith in him. And in verse 24 and 25, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus casts a vision for discipleship for Peter and his companions, a call to give up control of their life, a call to take up a cross. And just as Jesus would surrender uh, to the Father's plan willingly, going through suffering, then experiencing resurrection, so the disciples would be invited into the same life. And in verse 27, in 28, it says, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some uh, who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus promises that his disciples will see his glory, and now six days later, Jesus invites a few of them to taste a bit of that future glory. It's elevation time for Peter, James, and John. And there are echoes in this particular part of the story with the story of Moses. In Exodus 33, it says that Moses says, now show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. For Moses, he had already received the law of God. He had already experienced the deliverance from Egypt. Now here he was in the wilderness, and the cry of his heart was, show me 
your glory. Which is another way of saying, show me the value of who you are. Give me the understanding of who your character is. And it says in Exodus 34 that the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And as he passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Moses gets an understanding of the unchanging character of God. In our text this morning, this is exactly what is happening for Peter, James, and John, which leads us to the thing that they really beheld that day was that Jesus is the subject of all the Scripture. It says in verse 3 that just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. The disciples see Moses and Elijah having conversation with Jesus. And Matthew doesn't tell us what they're talking about because that's not the point of the revelation that, that Jesus is giving. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, everything that God has already said. And now they're talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah were representatives of the authority of the Jewish, for the Jewish people when it came to knowing who God was and what God's will for their lives. But on the mountain, the disciples see that there is now a higher authority, a more fuller and richer and complete picture of God, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus had been preparing his disciples for this moment. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, it says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The word fulfill is to complete. He has been challenging the religious people about what their authorities were and what they were basing their relationship with God on. Jesus says in John chapter 5, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus speaks to the religious people who were so focused on their Old Testament scriptures and they knew them backwards and forwards and yet he was telling them this one prevailing truth that we need to understand about the Bible. It is a unified story that points us to Jesus, the risen Christ, the person of Jesus. We don't need to pit scripture against scripture, Old Testament thoughts of God with New Testament thoughts of God, all of the Bible points us to the person of Jesus Christ and to behold him in his beauty. What the world needs now more than ever are followers of Jesus who present the Christ-like God. Pastor Brian Zahn from Word of Life in St. Joseph, Missouri says this, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We have not always known what God is like but now we do. That's what the, the disciples are witnessing. They're, they're seeing the revelation of God in the flesh. Everything that we've heard in Matthew from the beginning about the miraculous conception of Jesus being the Son of God is now on display on the mountain, which leads us to another thing that these disciples are going to see, and that is that Jesus is what God has to say. Listen to what it says in verse 4 and 5. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter's initial response was to do something. He talks about building shelters. The, the, the Greek word is that which is tabernacle or, or habitation. Another translation might look at it as building shrines or, or altars there for all three of them. He was in essence trying to equate Jesus with Moses and Elijah, putting them on the same basic authority. But in the moment, God interrupts. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This is an echo of what has already been said about Jesus. 
in his baptism when we followed him to the river at the beginning of our series. Listen again to what it says in Matthew 3. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Two different times in the book of Matthew, the voice from heaven came, speaking of Jesus, pointing everyone to him. And now the second time, this Father from heaven, this Almighty God speaks and points these disciples to Jesus. But then he adds something. Listen to him. Here is another echo of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 in some of his last words before he passed. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Moses sowed the seed of a higher authority who would be the prevailing voice for all God's people. That voice is Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the word of God. Listen to what John says as he introduces Jesus. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made and nothing has been made that hasn't, that, and, he, and without him nothing has been made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus is the word from heaven. He is the full revelation of God. A final thing that we learn here is that we are changed by looking at Jesus. It says in verse 6 and 7 that when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. This encounter produced a combination of both fear and comfort. The voice from heaven produced a sense of fear, and yet the touch of Jesus brought the sense of comfort. The disciples realized in this moment that the spotlight of God was on Jesus. God is bringing Peter and his disciples to a place of fascination with Jesus, a fixed focus on the truth of who Jesus is. Oh, friends. Too often times we get focused on all the wrong things. Ourself, the broken world, the church with all of its faults and flaws, the Bible with all of its challenging thoughts and ideas. But here is an irrefutable truth. We become like what we focus on. And so in this Lenten season, we're invited once again to climb the mountain and behold the beauty of Jesus and focus in on him so that our lives may be changed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, I hope you have been blessed and felt your soul lifted up by our music and our message. If you'd like more information about our ministries, you can visit us at genesisfayetteville.com. And now, may God, who so loved the world, including each of you, that he gave his only son, so now fill you with his spirit that you go forth and live in peace. Amen. Yes, right.